Uh, he, he hear me okay? Right. Good. All right, I'm um, Georgi Bobasov uh, at RTI International, and I'll be talking about ABMs as uh, AI systems. And so, but before I start, I just wanted to quickly uh, say what RTI is, because um, RTI is uh, actually the, the, the second largest uh, independent research organization uh, in the United States after Battelle. So um, uh, we do uh, research uh, in uh, all areas uh, that aim to improve human condition. And so uh, our uh, mission is to improve human condition by uh, turning knowledge into practice. So just you know, because I realized that for many, many years, RTI did not ever advertise uh, itself. And so very few people know what it is, despite who we are. Okay. So uh, let's go uh, uh, back to the presentation. So uh, one thing I've been running into uh, over the years, and now the, the, this, this discrepancy became very acute, is that uh, people consider agent-based models as something very exotic and something very different from uh, other methods. And uh, one of the um, uh, points that people make, like even when we write proposals or we discuss you know, pot potential approaches, uh, as everybody knows, uh, AI is a huge thing now. So that's where the funding, that's where the hype, you know, the, the, that's what people are talking about. And then when we try to position ABM and say, well, agent-based, like when, when we're writing a proposal, uh, AI for common good. And we say, oh, okay, well, of course, we can use agent-based models and we can show how it could help, you know, understanding what's happening in communities and how interventions will work. You say, no, 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 no. Uh, ABMs are just, it's a very separate, very specific, unique methodology. We really want to see AI, like deep learning. It's like, okay, rolling my eyes. <laughs> so um, uh, a couple of years ago, um, uh, I uh, uh, had a little paper where um, I was mentioning, like putting uh, method, um, simulation and predictive methods uh, kind of in, in one continuum, and just wanted to show that, well, uh, ABM are not any separate tool. It's just natural extension of other uh, methodologies like statistical modeling, and that's where, um, okay, machine learning, do I have a... Oh, uh, this is where uh, machine learning and uh, AI falls into. But then we can have the whole bunch of other uh, methods that expand um, uh, our uh, approaches to simulation and prediction in, uh, in a way to address more and more complexity. So um, when I was coming here, I was not sure what I should be talking about or how I should, you know, formulate my presentation because I was told like, well, you just have 10 minutes and then we'll just have a discussion. So I was like, okay, I'll throw five slides and uh, we'll, we'll uh, have a talk, which I still have. So but looking at the previous um, presentations, I realized that I can also show some, some of the models and talk about uh, uh, what we do in this area. But um, I think with models is pretty straightforward. You can just like go read the papers. I can send you, uh, uh, you know, like a net logo uh, model. So, so that's not as uh, um, interesting as I think what we can do collectively is to think about what is the future of ABM and how um, agent-based models can be positioned better as uh, AI tools. And so I was looking at various descriptions of what AI is. And uh, I was looking at Wikipedia, looking at MIT and Stanford reports. And everywhere when they describe what AI is, uh, is the decision making uh, based on information processing. And when you think of it uh, this way, you say like, well, uh, of course, you know, you can have very simple decision, or oh, is this a cat or not a cat, or a dog, <laughs> yeah. this is one thing. But this is what exactly we've been doing for years and years in agent-based modeling. We were trying to 
understand uh, how agents or how communities make their decisions and how these decisions could translate into uh, whatever our outcomes and results. But where um, uh, that decision making is coming from, of course, it comes from, from uh, uh, information uh, processing. And so uh, we can do that at individual level, and I can talk a little bit about building very complex agents and um, essentially putting uh, things like deep learning inside an agent. So we have like extremely smart agents that uh, do lots of um, uh, uh, interesting cognition. But also uh, what I think agent-based models are doing that deep learning is not doing yet is um, working at the population level. Uh, I've seen uh, a number of approaches that people use now when making better predictions, when they use ensembles of deep learning uh, uh, tools. But ensembles are not informative. These are just like random, uh, random gen you know, uh, uh, replications of this uh, um, deep learning machine. And deep learning machine could be you know, complex, could be uh, uh, more complex, less complex. But when we're talking about agents, agents who have very complex interactions, and so that's where I think we need to emphasize the artificial intelligence part of, the, uh, uh, of ABM. And uh, so uh, there are other things that uh, AI has been uh, used for, like uh, forecasting uh, and making decisions uh, based on you know, like uh, uh, best forecast, best, uh, best decisions uh, that you can find. Uh, so how can you, like, again, all these ensemble um, models fitting, and that's where um, uh, ABM, again, um, uh, I think coming forward. And uh, finally is uh, what Josh was talking about, about how you make or try to reconstruct best decisions or optimize um, uh, decision making out of the uh, potential soup of decisions. So in the same way as uh, biologists are trying to reconstruct DNA and say, okay, well, DNA is a very intelligent structure that replicates itself and just you know, uh, serves all kinds of very interesting features, but can you actually build DNA from putting all the components together and just have this soup uh, swirling around. So, um, what? Uh, yeah, okay. So, what I wanted to say. So, so this is essentially the the, the, the central slide where I wanted to end uh, the presentation and start a discussion. But uh, then I thought, okay, I might, be, might might give you a few, few, few specific examples. Example. So, um, because at RTI we work with uh, specific problems. So we develop methodologies only when we realize that for solving a particular problem, we don't have enough existing methods. So uh, unlike many universities that might focus specifically on methodologies. So we always have to start with a problem. Okay, so what could be interesting problems that agent-based models could solve uh, that other methods could not solve? So uh, one is um, prediction with forecasted uh, future responses. So this is um, where I'm not satisfied with the way current agents are uh, being programmed. And I, and I bet, you know, well, so somebody has already done that because whenever I come up with an idea and it's like, oh, Georgi, you came up with a brilliant idea. Uh, then you start Googling it, like, oh, okay, well, there are like, you know, 100 publications of, uh, about that. Okay. But anyway, so the idea behind it is, 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 is the following. When agents make decision about the future, they kind of like analyzing the past. And, but this is not how humans are making decisions. Humans have fantasies. And for example, if you think about, I don't know, like going camping for the weekend, 
you do not want to look at the weather forecast, which was, you know, last, like, you know, if we're going this weekend, okay, well, what was the weather last year on this date? Or what was the, 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 the weather three days ago? You just really want to think, okay, what, you know, just looking forward, what will be the weather uh, uh, this weekend? Then as you start planning, you say, okay, well, we just need to load our van with, uh, you know, we need to have tents and stuff just in case if it rains, we need to uh, get some food. If you're traveling with kids, you need to say, okay, well, somewhere like two hours down the road, they will get hungry, so you probably need to stop by whatever McDonald's. So, so this is how humans are thinking. So, so we have these fantasies and thinking ahead. So what I, uh, um, uh, I'm trying to uh, work on right now is to uh, build an agent-based model where agents, agents first run the model, kind of like in their head, collect this information, process it, and only based on that fantasy processing, it could be perfect or not perfect, whatever, then they make that decision. So whenever we make one step forward, we're actually you know, running all these models. Well, uh, of course, computational issues will be huge, uh, but that's where NSF funding might come into picture and whatever the um, uh, uh, quantum computing that becomes popular, they say, okay, they might help us with, <laughs> with, with, with all these uh, ideas. So, but this means that we will create very complex models. The agents themselves might not be very uh, um, complex. Uh, then we can, of course, build a, a complex agents, and uh, there were uh, a number of presentations already today where agents process lots of information. They try to, you know, whether, whether they run complex models or the simpler models, regression models, whatever, but, uh, or they could have some uh, neural networks or deep learning machines sitting in their head, and they, uh, 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 they make um, uh, these decisions. Uh, what um, uh, Josh uh, was talking about um, uh, uh, the other day is that can we reconstruct decision-making uh, fields? And I was telling Stephen uh, a story from my childhood. I grew up in the uh, Soviet Union, and my uncle uh, was lucky to travel to the United States. He was, he was a physicist, and he brought me jeans, which I was very happy about. And then he brought me something, like a little box, that I was very curious about. And all my friends and I were trying to figure out what it was. It had batteries and had a few buttons. It had a very interesting field with 10-yard lines along this. It had two strange posts at the end. And in the middle, there would be a line with some really strange looking ball, look like, like rugby ball, whatever. And it had like pictures of crazy people with helmets, with some masks and some tights. And you push the button and there will be windows that will generate some numbers, some yards, and then they will also generate other things. And we were just pushing all these buttons, trying to figure out like moving these lines, anything like what the hell this thing does. And so, yeah, and, and everybody would come up with their, <laughs> their own idea. So in this sense, uh, I was thinking about if we uh, start training an agent-based model by showing it footages of so many uh, football games. And with all these football games, we know how many players are around. So, so we can reconstruct very clearly you know, who are the players, what, the, you know, uh, uh, what are the environment, the scale. But can we actually by <laughs> give them some rules, the soup of rules, and just make them uh, run around and do that? So uh, that's, um, uh, uh, that's a really cool idea. So I would you know, be very happy to, <laughs> to work with you on this. Um, uh, then interesting things that we um, uh, ran into um, <coughs> recently is a prediction of complex interactions that are not possible in real world. And the idea behind it is like when we are creating virtual communities, uh, then we might want to try some interventions and specifically disasters and specifically things that, that you cannot run an experiment. 
uh, on. You cannot say, okay, well, what if there will be a hurricane that will destroy half of the village and how the village will uh, 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 respond? So let's do a trial, you know, allocate certain area, and in this area we'll destroy half of the villages, and this area will not destroy half of the villages, you know, and then <laughs> we compare, you know, <laughs> we cannot do that. But we can do that in, in, um, in virtual uh, world. Uh, and this is where um, things become interesting. So, for example, in supply chain management, uh, they use um, agent-based models as data generator and then build AI machine learning emulator on the top of that. So, for example, if you are a huge company, I don't know, like Boeing, right, so that builds these airplanes and have supply chains of, from, from all over the world, then you want to understand how the supply chain could get interrupted if certain companies get bankrupt or there will be a war between, you know, like two countries, we'll not mention, you know, which could they be or, or whatever. And so how that will interrupt supply chain. We can do, you know, of course, you cannot run these experiments, so you can only do that in uh, a virtual world. But then you don't want to run this huge ABMs. You want to have a smaller uh, neural network that will be an emulator of that. And you train your uh, neural networks on, uh, uh, on ABM. So uh, that's um, uh, uh, this. Oh, yeah, the, the last one I wanted to uh, say is an example, uh, again, the opposite to having um, uh, machine learning in, um, uh, in individuals. Uh, the opposite will be is to take agent-based model and make it as a component of a deep learning uh, algorithm. And, and um, I will show you an example of that uh, that you know, I really want to develop further is because when people use machine learning tools, uh, they are uh, information agnostic. They, not, they don't care about what the underlying uh, mechanisms are, so it's just based on the data. But if we know that there are certain, uh, certain mechanisms, uh, I work a lot in uh, drug use uh, area and, uh, for example, in opioid um, research, we know that naloxone saves lives. We know that if you uh, um, stop prescribing uh, uh, pills, there will be less uh, use of those uh, uh, prescription opiates. So how people will be adapting uh, to, to that is a completely different story. But there are certain things that you already know just purely mechanistically. So can we take those things or take those behaviors and put in um, uh, machine learning? So yeah, these are the, the areas uh, where I think uh, ABMs and uh, AI, uh, well, so just Maybe I'm preaching to the crowd, <laughs> to the choir, to say that yes, ABM is a is a quintessential AI, and that's how we might want to position it as, you know, as a collective to 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 to, to educate the the world about that too. All right, so um, yeah, that that was the the, the part of um, you know. What, was the purpose of the presentation. So now I want to give a few examples of um, how uh, uh, ABMs uh, could be uh, applicable to um, uh, uh, these complex structures and uh, be viewed as artificial intelligent uh, systems. So when we consider uh, opioid epidemic, uh, uh, and it is very, very complex. So there are processes that happening, uh, what, what uh, um, National Institute of Health called um, below the skin. So these are all neurobiology. It is all uh, physiology, pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamics model, but most interestingly, it's neurobiology. And then that will affect individual behavior. But then individual behavior will also be um, um, uh, affected, you know, so we have short-term behavior, you know, making a choice, use the drug, not use the drug. We can also have a choice, um, you know, like long-term choice, uh, right? Just go into treatment, not go into treatment. And then we can have 
uh, our local environment. Uh, we can have our social networks, uh, peer pressure and whatnot. And then we can have also the larger environment like legal system, okay? Uh, whether marijuana is legal or illegal, you know, this is one of the biggest issues. Just should you raise um, uh, smoking age to um, uh, 21 or not, or, uh, and, and, and so on. So now when we have this hierarchy of systems uh, do we want to put them all together or should we put them together or should we stay with individual components? That, that's an open question because if we start putting it all together, it will be incredibly complex model. But on the other hand, when we're talking about AI and all these models that people are building right now, perhaps we really want to build an incredibly complex model. <laughs> all right. So, um, yeah, here are the, so some of the examples of the models that we have developed, but each of the model only addresses one part of uh, uh, um, opioid epidemic. And so I'm contemplating, uh, you know, just going for, for a bigger model, but have a hard time convincing NIH <laughs> funding that. But this is uh, where things become interesting. So when we talk about uh, ABMs, uh, the, the rules change uh, as people uh, uh, move through life. And one of the uh, very important parts of, say, um, drug use process in general is that at the initial state uh, around initialization, uh, drug, drug use has features of contagion. So, okay, I'm uh, smoking pot, I'm having great time, and Josh is passing by. I said, Josh, come on, you know, just having this, uh, you know what I mean? And he sees, like, okay, right? But then, uh, it, uh, anything Yorgi says. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but, but the same thing with opioids, when, you know, people take, uh, uh, take the pills and they feel much better, they can, you know, share that information with them. With, with others and help uh, uh, help people in distress, but as people keep using drugs more and more and more, that's what happens with the brain structure. So the uh, uh, the you know what we observe is brain plasticity. So uh, brain elasticity meaning that okay, you just had a few drinks, you wake up the next day, you have some headaches, hangover, but okay, well. In, in two days, you're fine, just forget that, keep, keep going your way. But if you continuously use a drug like alcohol or opioids, uh, what could happen is that the processes uh, will become not reversible and they will become plastic. And so that's where individual is entering a chronic disease phase. And these types of models uh, could and should be very, very different because there are different rules of behavior, uh, different response to uh, external clues, and, uh, uh, and so on. And on the top of that, so when we're just taking one pathway, and this is for um, uh, prescription opioids, so we can uh, take an individual uh, going from uh, pain, um, uh, 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 use of, um, you know, having pain, getting uh, prescriptions, uh, for pain, they start using it, and then eventually some people can become dependent, some can end up in treatment, uh, can uh, use uh, heroin, can overdose, and so on. Uh, when we build different um, um, uh, interventions, interventions work at different parts of that pathway. So, for example, naloxone revives individuals who are overdosed. But that intervention has absolutely nothing to do with um, uh, getting prescriptions and getting use and uh, moving into uh, moving along the the, the the dependence scale. So uh, these things are not working independently. So we really need to to to, to understand how all these interventions are uh, um, working simultaneously. And so this is where we have a major knowledge gap. So there is practically no data, very little data, uh, what happens to an individual going from recreational use to um, uh, dependence um, and addiction. And so 
that's where we are working with ethnographers, with uh, medical uh, records, and so on. So, but my point here is that before we, it, it could take years and years before we get data, before we fill this gap. Does it mean that we shouldn't be building models? That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be answering the questions. And my approach is like, of course not. So we can think, you know, we can come up with our best guess or best estimates or, you know, just use it as calibration um, a, a parameter to understand how these processes, you know, like what, uh, what's happened in the middle. When we get data, that will be great. So um, this is what uh, we uh, have proposed and have been uh, working on for quite a while, is uh, <clears throat> that the use and transition from uh, use to um, dependence is uh, guided by uh, an opponent uh, uh, process um, mechanism. And the idea is uh, very simple, is that uh, whenever you have a strong emotion uh, whether it's positive or negative, so uh, this is process A, it's eventually being negated by a slower uh, and longer um, uh, opponent process B. And this is an evolutionary uh, um, uh, 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 development because uh, imagine that you, you know, just fixing something and slammed your finger with a hammer, you know, yes, your finger is damaged, you are in pain, so, uh, and the pain will not go away in, you know, in half an hour or an hour. So your, your, your finger will still be damaged. But if you can continue just jumping and screaming, you will be totally dysfunctional, right? So your brain, of course, receives a very sharp signal, yes, there is pain, but now it starts the opponent process B saying, okay, well, let's numb it up so that you can just go see a physician, you can just fix it, you know, and continue going with, with your own life. So uh, the same thing with positive or negative uh, 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 emotions. And so we had an idea that, uh, this, that there is a cascade of um, uh, these opponent uh, processes. And we developed a uh, model for a, a, a virtual smoker that describes daily smoking patterns and transition from daily use to, um, uh, uh, to dependence. And we can try various uh, uh, interesting things with it, as adding external uh, stimuli, uh, um, you know, adding uh, droughts, like what will happen if a person quits and says, okay, I will not have a cigarette anymore, and just, you know, goes for five days, and we will see how craving and um, uh, a craving will peak in about 30 days, and we are trying to use it in treatment to tell patients that you know, if you quit, this is what we expect will happen to you. So if you have craving and if you develop, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, of course you will go through withdrawal, then you will develop uh, strong craving. That's where you will expect the peak of it. So it's not that you have lack of will, but it's something that is natural response of your brain. But the good thing is that if you go over that peak, if you say don't smoke for three months, then you, know, you have 90% chance that you will not smoke for a year. So, so these are the things that um, uh, we want to further uh, develop. But again, th 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 this is individual agents. So now we want to put them all together in uh, a situation. So, so, so this is where um, uh, we, uh, build a uh, model for uh, a community. It's called Pain Town. Um, so we now take these patients, uh, to, to take these uh, individuals uh, that, that have this opponent process uh, mechanism uh, uh, in them, and we connect them. This is a very simplified, like overly simplified uh, representation of that town. So we have a number of users. Uh, we have drug dealers. We have pharmacies. We have physicians. Uh, and one of the uh, uh, thing, of course, is just to understand how, how can we respond to uh, various interventions uh, th that are related to um, uh, opioid um, uh, uh, epidemic. And one of the things that we've been 
showing uh, quite su well, surprisingly or non-surprisingly is that um, all of the actions to stop prescribing or reduce prescribing will not have immediate effect. I mean, and, and you, if you think of it, I mean, like, you know, we all are modelers, you understand, okay, well, there is a flow of new patients coming in, and so they, they, they're just coming in, and then they eventually, like, die or, you know, or, or, or quit, whatever. All right, so if you stop the flow, uh, uh, stop initiation, you still have the big mass of patients that will still keep move, <laughs> moving through a lot and still go through uh, 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 issues of um, you know, getting dependent and uh, uh, getting in problems. So essentially the point is to show that uh, these inter like if, if you implement interventions, you, you should not expect uh, seeing an effect of it within the next year. You just really need to wait, so, so it's a long term. And this is what policymakers have really hard time to digest because you, know, you just really want to say, yes, we issued this regulation or law, you know, it just came in effect this May, so by September we want to, by election or whatever, we just want to see the results, right? So um, am I out of time? Yeah, wrap up soon. All right, so just, okay. Quick, quick question. So this is some, some of my old work with time series where we say, okay, we just take a theoretical model and we take uh, a neural network and we plug in a theoretical model. Well, it was not agent-based model, but it was uh, um, uh, differential equations, uh, of course, but um, uh, you can plug them in uh, neural networks to predict time series and you will actually see a much bigger um, uh, prediction, uh, much better prediction long term. So, so the ones that did not have uh, the model, so their uh, predictive R square would uh, naturally go down as you predict a, a longer term effect. But you know, when you have um, a mechanistic model in there, it just uh, uh, helps uh, uh, quite quite a bit. And finally, I wanted to uh, mention. Uh, our uh, synthetic population uh, that we use for um, uh, building these communities. And one of the biggest things that we're uh, doing here, and this is again a big part of AI that, that I you know, emphasize that it is true AI, is linking multiple data sets through synthetic population. And uh, this is one of the big challenge in big data. Uh, if you have um, clinical trials data, you have patient's record, you have administrative data, you have survey data, so how you link all these data sets together. And so you can do that through synthetic populations that represent every person um, uh, essentially in the uh, country. And uh, you could start linking multiple data sets and then you can uh, run your uh, simulation models, you can say, okay, based on this data, uh, what will happen to these individuals? You can map um, uh, map it back and uh, uh, see what you, what happens uh, at geographic uh, level. So, in any way, so that's that's it. Uh, I just want to end up at this. Come on, yeah, at this slide because this is where I really want to have more discussions because you know other things are published. You can just read them. Thank you. Time for a few questions. Yeah, so uh, I was really excited by your um, idea of training um, machine learning algorithm on footage of football games um, and then trying to have that be the target that you inverse generate with uh, agent-based modeling systems or just with agent behavior try to generate the rules. Um, and my immediate thought was to contrast that with the um, unsupervised learning projects that happen with uh, team video games. So you have multi-agent, um, I guess, unsupervised learning mm -hmm. processes. Um, and where, you know, these, these teams and these, I guess, agents uh, are playing against each other indefinitely, and they develop really great strategies, but they're not human-like. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder if um, the former approach 
uh, using the agent-based model as the output could produce more human-like behavior using than than just having unlimited. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that, that that's absolutely possible. And in fact, we wanted to um, get a project, um, but that turned out to be a long stretch. And that was a few years ago. The technology was not yet there. I still don't know whether it's here or not, but one of the things um, uh, we tried to do, and this is a very big issue in North Carolina, and probably like everywhere in the United States, is the, the uh, issue of police violence. And um, they are, because now police wearing body cameras, so whenever there is an altercation between uh, a police officer and a suspect that they arrest, and uh, this are, these arrests could become violent. Uh, uh, or similar things at TSA, people are going through screening and well, some people could be upset or you know, police needs to arrest somebody for suspected whatever, like water bottle. Or not. And um, the, the question is, can we, because we have, like everything is on video, can we decipher the Footage. Of, I mean, like for, from that footage, what were the rules? What are the major rules of police officers? Because one thing, if you ask a police officer uh, why they were doing it, they could tell you the story what they believe has happened. But sometimes when you look at the footage, you see that oh no, actually this is not. So I think Josh had a really great idea a while ago. Uh, I don't know. Like I, I missed your presentation yesterday. If you mentioned it, it's just. First, before we get into real life, just to go with some, you know, toy models, and can we do that with, like, you know, when, when, when can one ABM uh, uh, understand another ABM? <laughs> because after we're successful there, then we can go into humans and say, okay, well, at least, <laughs> you know, for certain cases we can, you know, we can do that, you know. So I was actually also, piqued, my interest was piqued by that idea of um, inferring games rules by watching it played. And the way I was thinking about it was um, it feels generative to me. So it feels like I should be able to, it's a very high dimensional space and if I can present it to a neural network, I could auto encode it. Mm -hmm. And then I would have a uh, um, lower dimensional embedding, which presumably would have, you know, um, the right uh, associations of correlations of all the inputs, but I'm not sure what to do with that embedding. <laughs> um, and, and the other way to think about it is, say I had a GAN or a generative model, um, if you could present the game and the commentary, for example, mm -hmm. could you infer the rules? Because often these conditional GANs are more helpful than the mm -hmm. non-conditional you know, non GAN, but it's an interesting problem to try and do it with other methods, but still uh, how those other methods would actually come up with rules is, is a great question. Right? Mm -hmm. They may just be able to play it, play the game. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I think what, what, one of the uh, things that, that's, is that, that some people are not <laughs> viewing ABMs as AIs is because they're like, well, but you don't have enormous amounts of data. So like in order to be AI, you just really need to have you know, millions and millions of, of, of pictures. And if you think of uh, you know models that uh, Robin is uh, uh, have shown, like well, like he has you know like 20 observations or whatever. I mean, like, oh, you know, if you have 20 observations and you're trying to fit it there, it's just, it's not AI. Which I totally disagree. But I mean, it's, you know, that's 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 one of the things. So so you know, moving into you know, rules and the games, because at least this is low-hanging fruit, like relatively, relatively low. Well, and it becomes reminiscent of what you guys were talking about, the alcohol study, because you could have micro behavior and then you could have macro behavior right. so if you paired the two. But you need to have two pieces of things that are correlated mm -hmm. with, without, without you having a score even or right, yeah. watching the scoring or some sort of other thing to correlate what you were seeing with and induce it. Mm -hmm. Because these guys had a ton of data, right, micro, at the micro level, right? We've got, yeah. Yeah, yeah, much data at the micro level, but the macro phenomena that you were tracking was annual, right? The state, I mean, the data was different. Though. So there is, I mean, some of them, it's an aside, really, but 
some of the most interesting alcohol data is from the long, you know the cohort longitudinal studies, and some of the, some of the most interesting observations in those are that people claim in wave eight that they're a lifetime abstainer, but you have the data from waves one and two that shows that they were a heavy drinker. Yeah, so that there's a, there's a lot of that sort of stuff in the longitudinal data sets. Yeah. So yeah, I always thought the, the one way we might make money doing genetic evolutionary programming is to invent new football plays. <laughs> Instead of permissible yeah. plays, it's got to be this vast combinatorial set, and surely the plays NFL coaches have dreamed up don't nearly, it's not been efficiently searched. So might actually make a few bucks if we did that. But if you showed it, I, I often I wonder about this very problem all the time, and I'm sure you and I have discussed it this business about could you infer the rules of the game from watching the game. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think if you really just start with an overhead movie, okay, everybody has to wear the same uniform, both teams, and you just show the movie from top down and ask the machine, how many, are there any teams? How, how, are there two teams? Are they the same size? It's very, very hard to really, I mean, I, mean, I don't know whether yeah, it is. Yeah, but I mean, I, sometimes I'm you know, listening to the radio and I'm listening to the guy announce the baseball game and I'm asking myself, could I infer the rules of baseball from this guy's commentary? And I think it's a very hard problem. I mean, it's a hard problem for me. I may not, I may not be as smart as an AI machine, but I think those are very rich ways to do this. In a simplified version, I think it would be very useful. To, yeah, but uh, using a synthetic output that we know what's going on, and then, you know. And so, but then you have to be very aware, or what I'm aware of is, if you, if you give me that puzzle of how would I generate really cool new football moves. Yeah. What I would do is I would build a generative model of it with machine with deep learning. Right. And then I take my generative model and I generate lots of them and I play them out. And right. Which ones are right. <laughs> and then if I want to make a decision on how much impact on the computer, I could actually make a conditional advantage. So I wouldn't even be solving the same. Yeah. But, but, but I was thinking also, you know, I didn't mention it here. The, 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 oh, sorry. But that's not the same as figuring out the rules of the right. game. That's given exactly. the rules of the game, what's an optimal play. Mm -hmm. And this is about. But I mean, could you do this for tic tac toe? Yeah. Uri Walensky and I were talking about it. He thinks it's simple yeah. to do for tic tac toe. Yeah, yeah so, 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 uh, you know, I was thinking about also convolutional uh, ABMs in that sense. So, for example, um, because the problem of figuring out the rules of the game of basketball could be like very, very complex. So imagine, like, but, but we know those rules. So let's code them, except maybe one rule or, or something like this. You know, like when you say, okay, are there two teams or, or one team? Yeah. And so, and, and we train the, the, the model to, to see how it recognizes that one rule. Nice. Then you can say, okay, well, it, now we've learned something about how it trains and where, uh, uh, so now we'll, we'll do the same thing, but like remove two rules and see how it constructs it. And so the, the, the idea, you know, just the, the analogy with convolutional um, neural networks is that you know, when they first build a model to recognize a cat, because there are, you know, millions of photographs of cats. So you can just, you know, train it and, you know, recognize cats with very high accuracy. But now if you want to recognize weasels, there are not many pictures of weasels. So if you want to train convolutional network, it will give you crappy prediction. But so what you want to do is you want to Stop it, you know, like look at all these layers and say, okay, well, this is an uh, um, uh, object, an animal, a mammal, you know, and then you say, okay, I will chop off that node, that, 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 that layer that, that says that this is a cat. And so now I don't need this many images of weasels to train that last layer. So the same thing here, if we trained our model, ABM, for uh, you know, reproducing football game. Now we say, okay, uh, can it, can we retrain it to recognize a basket, a basketball game? Mm -hmm. So now we just don't need to train, you know, like everything. We just say, okay, we know that there are two teams that go like, you know, they have two sides. <laughs> the ball has to go. <laughs> oh, that's a really important point, which I think in a lot of this has to do with representation, right? Mm -hmm. and what you're talking about is that if you actually 
have a representation of what the games are like, right? Like, mm-hmm. based on exactly, that, yeah. Then it becomes a lot easier to work with. I mean, yeah. I think part of the problem is that we need to come up with, like, learning, like, the classic example I always like to point out is I remember that in my first um, graduate level class on computer vision, right, we were supposed to build a neural net to detect circles in a, in a, in an image, right? And everyone else kind of apparently figured out really quickly that if you're doing bounding boxes, you only have to learn two corners. And I didn't think of that. And so I made my neural net learn four corners, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm trying, so I'm learning not just squares, I'm learning all sorts of boxes and things like that around the circles. And it turned out that that's a much harder problem to solve, mm-hmm. right? That, 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 that the, the same machine learning apparatus thrown at that problem is going to take orders of magnitude longer to solve that problem than the other one. And so I guess the, the point I want to make is that you can't just say, can we learn the rules from observing the behavior? It's can we learn from the rules from observing the behavior given a representation mm-hmm. of what those rules might be in? Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's not right. Yeah. Can My I, question is also, can we, lear- can we learn the behaviors in a way that is easy to understand and explain. So without trying to understand what the overall rules are, can we say, well, what is, how does this basketball player make decisions? Can we, can we simplify that in a way that is easy to explain to a person? Yeah, so following on from that, another perspective on the problem is, especially since if, if we're building the simulation, unfortunately, we know the rules of the game already. But the agents don't necessarily. Mm-hmm. Right. So this is like a revealed preference versus a stated preference study. You can go in and say, what do the agents think is going on here? And how is mm-hmm. it that you know, we've, we've got one population in this country, and they seem to have completely opposite views on so many different things. <laughs> how does that happen? You're right. Maybe you could use agent-based modeling and inverse generative social science to study the emergence of that right. kind of phenomenon. I think you should put in, put in, you know, all of horrific human history and see if you inverse generate the Ten Commandments. <laughs> <laughs> thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. I mean, they wouldn't even be in the, they would, they'd be ranked at Well, I, I think that's a good spot that we should cut off. <laughs> 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 move on to the next one. I want to make sure we get it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.